special interest group. Um, I think at that stage, we, I particularly got quite um, excited about sharing zones of regulation and, and interception. And uh, I think at that point in time, I was in the sensory zone, but uh, I was in the yellow zone. But right now, I think I'm about in the red zone. So please stay with me and um, as we share our presentations with you. So I'm going to start first by sharing my presentation. We'll go for about to have some time for questions at the end. Okay. So, yes, basically, for myself, big disclaimer, I'm not a guru. I'm not an authority in sensory modulation or interception. But I just love doing this type of work. And, um, and the beauty of this case study is that it worked well this time, but it might not work as well for the next client, because as we know, every client is individual. So, okay, let's, let's get powering. Okay. So, as we know, the, uh, one of the gurus in sensory um, processing and sensory regulation is Winnie Dunn. And the experience of being human is embedded into sensory sense of our everyday lives. Listening to music, exercising, meditation, eating, morning coffee, and any other sensory-based activity. So I'd actually like to kind of just bring our minds to what our actual sensory system is doing right now. Um, for me in particular, if I was to scan my interception right now, my breathing is going hell, hellfire, it's going right through the roof. My heart rate is going through the roof. My body temperature is going high. <laughs> my digestive system is probably shutting down a bit. There was a beautiful lunch that was put on, which was really nice, but I haven't really had an opportunity to embrace that yet. And I'm definitely very alert and probably in high arousal, okay? Because I'm not a natural presenter. So bear with me and hopefully you guys have all of your sensory regulating activities because probably the majority might have had lunch or are on their lunch break. Sit back and relax. Okay, so who am I? My little person uh, was referred to me following a concussion three years earlier. I um, worked with this 11 year old boy um, for about six months. When I first met the family, they'd actually had quite a lot of uh, therapy input over the years, over the three year period since injury. So I wanted to look at things quite differently. I wanted to see what had actually been done, what had he hear from the client, because he was 11 years old, he was able to articulate exactly what went well for him, what hadn't, and where he felt that his actual kind of areas of need were. We used the PEO model. So P, person, 11 year old, with concussion, had never managed to get back to school consistently since his injury. He was the middle child of three boys and a very close knit family. The whole family loved basketball. In fact, mum and dad were coaches and he was part of one of the teams. Um, they had a very popular household in the neighborhood, so their house was the one that all the kids would come and hang around at. It was an open door policy and the family really prided themselves in that. They lived very close to school, so they're walking distance to school. And the family had a very strong uh, relationship with school. So mum was a volunteer there, she was often at school, kind of like a full time job. So and all of the boys attended the same primary school. Obviously, when we look at the occupation, so the occupation was to attend school and to have fun, play basketball. He would say, I want to be able to go to school. I want to play with my friends. I want to do my work and not get tired and get headaches. The environment that we were working within was the local primary school. As I said, all of his brothers went there, his mum worked there, um, and his school was set up in what they call a flexible learning environment, which was an open plan space uh, with kind of three classes into, into one learning space. So at some times there would be between about 80 to 90 children and three teachers um, within this um, flexible learning environment. So we had to take all of those factors um, into consideration. 
and not to also discount the fact that he had received multidisciplinary interventions on several programs spanning over two and a half years. However, sensory regulation seemed, for some reason, to be a new concept in the family. Um, I should point out that mum was a Reiki uh, therapist and uh, did a lot of massage and also was very keen on, um, and used a lot of aromatherapy oils. So we already had some natural sensory regulation um, kind of activities happening in the household anyway, uh, which you know, that was just, just part of everyday life, which was fantastic. One of the other kind of factors I wanted to take into consideration was actually blending in a trauma-informed approach. So, um, we you really he was in high arousal a lot of the time he was melting down at school he was coming on from school early most days and he would have a long periods of time off school and uh, during that time the parents went into survival mode and would really kind of like felt that school was not a safe place for him um, so yeah so we needed to kind of look at this from a different lens, taking into consideration what had happened previously as well and what was happening for him currently. So that's our person. The first thing that I did um, is I did a sensory profile assessment and um, which gave us a real good oversight as to what was actually happening for him. As you can see here from his score profile, he had quite significant um, uh, endurance. So his body position processing, his endurance um, to um, physical activities during, during the day. He would fatigue, as, as we know, with kids who um, got this type of injury, um, you know, the neural fatigue that he would actually um, fatigue and experience headaches. Um, he would actually seek out a lot of oral input and um, he would chew on his claws and on his um, neck collars and things. And he was already actually kind of regulating himself by um, the, the triple X mints uh, that you can get superpower. He would, um, he would, you know, have go through quite a lot of those packets um, throughout the week. Um, so basically, in the flexible learning environment, his auditory sensitivity was sending into overload and definitely a trigger to some of his um, headaches, migraines, and needing to have time off school. We realized through the sensory profile that he actually wasn't monitoring his internal bodily signals. So he was very rarely seeking out water throughout the day. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't monitoring when he was thirsty, when he was hungry. He wasn't able to monitor his body temperature. So he'd come in after playtime and recess, red, red face, still got, you know, three layers of clothing on and, um, and would not actually, um, would not actually kind of take anything off and, and adjust, adjust to his actual, what he needed. Um, so what we found was that he was in leading the We will be testing code blue. Okay, sorry. Um, we just need to have everybody on mute. Sorry. Code blue from the emergency department. All the background. Okay, I'll continue. Um, also what we could see there was from his behavioral score section that um, social and emotional responses were much more than other children. Um, that. Um, and his ability to actually pay attention and stay on task was affected as well. This is his score profile um, on the bell curve. Um, so as you can see, we've got the auditory processing um, presenting as more than others. Um, his visual processing and movement processing was just like the most of others and his body position and oral sensory processing was much more than others. He also had quite significant tactile uh, sensitivities, um, which were impacting, especially if you imagine in a flexible learning environment with that amount of children and teachers in one space, 
there were a lot of triggers for him. Um, okay, so right at that start, the things that I started to look at for my client, we started to actually pull on his strengths in visual processing. And right at the very start, before school went back at the beginning of the year, I talked with mum about um, supporting his executive functioning. And we looked at establishing visual weekly timetables um, so that he knew what week one was going to look like going back into the term. Um, so that was quite, um, quite a different type of week. Uh, week one was like introduction to tech and I don't know, various different things that were off, off site at the, from school. Um, and so he had a lot of anxiety about what he was going back into school and what it was actually going to look like. So firstly, we got um, I say a visual weekly timetable up from the teacher so that he could start preparing himself cognitively for what he was going back for. So that cognitive preparation then was helping to reduce um, you know, some of his anxiety. Um, because it was um, a bit more known what was going to be expected of him. We also looked at setting up some just some really basic systems um, in relation to organisational skills. So we looked at using the power of colour. So we looked at um, getting um, you know some ring binders and folders for certain subjects. So red red folder was maths, blue was uh, English, uh, etc. And we we also um, just played around with, you know, like when the kids go back and they've got the pencil case and they'll have the pens, rubbers and felt tips and everything all in one spot. And it's hard to find that one thing that you're looking for. We actually just got a really cheap texture plastic um, container um, from Kmart, which had everything just set out really nicely. So you can visually see exactly what color you want. And it was just about kind of organizing his, you know, his materials, his tools and his um, school bag a bit easier. So when he was needing to find something and he might potentially be in high arousal, he was able to visually just see it straight away. So one of the concepts that I wanted to blend in with this family was because like from a whole systems perspective, he was in high arousal a lot of the time. The school were in high arousal a lot of the time because the, they were expecting meltdowns or they're expecting that they were gonna to have to, he was gonna be in the sick bay and they were needing to do something about that. Um, but also his parents, uh, particularly his mum, was in a lot of high arousal. So I wanted to work on, um, I started blending in, the neuro sequential model uh, from Bruce Perry, which looks at um, the brainstem calming activities. So you can see the rest of the slide there actually. Um, so basically it looks at all of the regulating sensory inputs that we can um, that we can look at. And as, as OTs, we, we, we do a lot of it anyway in sensory regulation. So we're looking at the movement, the proprioception and the rhythm. But the additional kind of element was actually integrating breath work. Um, so quite often we, you know, we could go into mindfulness and or relaxation methods but actually really focusing on um, integrating breath activities um, into the child's day um, in some ways can actually really help to establish um, a stronger link with what's happening um, uh, in their nervous system. So we really focused on yeah, the sensory regulation at the brainstem level to get the calming inputs in so that then the emotional stability is strengthened, which then allows us to um, access the high cost for our functions for his um, speech and language executive functioning. And um, yeah, all of the things that he needs uh, to be a successful student. So I just put this visual in, and as you'll see through our presentations, we've put, um, you know, we've put hyperlinks and references um, as much as possible. So I really like the Beacon House um, resources and so this is developed by uh, Bruce Perry and so here it just is a nice visual that basically says you know the child's brains organize from the bottom to the top so we when we're working with kids who are in the fight flight or freeze response 
what we really need to be looking at is getting some brainstem sensory motor input, getting some of those calming inputs in um, and the brainstem level to then be able to get the, um, the system organized and regulated to be able to access the thinking and learning areas of the brain. So there's some really nice um, and really basic stuff, you know, for OTs, it's movement, it's rhythm, it's breath. Um, so they've got some really lovely resources on their website. So we, as OTs, we put on our investigators thinking cap and we were like, gosh, this, this little person has had so much input over the years. What can we add, if anything? Um, what can we do that hasn't been done before? Um, um, yeah, what's going on? So we put on our detective hat um, to identify things that can make him feel good and just right. So we use a lot of those words. We want to get to just right. So yeah. the, um, how's your engine? What kind of conference? Yeah. Oh. Um, we got the parents to put on their detective hat to review um, the child's behaviours and presentations at different times of the day. To focus on what, what works to help get him just right. So they were already using some nice things. He came home from school, he was having, you know, the, the curtains were drawn, a mum would have some nice calming blends um, in the uh, diffuser. Um, she'd make sure he'd have a full tummy and he'd have some downtime before anybody else came around to want to play with him. We got the teaching staff, in particular the teacher aide, to put on the detective hat and become more aware of the sensory and social elements of the environment. Um, looking at, you know, paying more attention of what's supportive and what's not supportive. Um, with regards to if you think about the social context and those regulating relationships or dysregulating relationships, so depending you choose who you sit with, who's going to support you, to, you know, to be in to be in the right space. Um, okay, Peter's just told me I'm running out of time, so I really need to speed up because I've got a heap more to get through. So sorry, Tara, I won't eat into your time, but I might just eat in a little bit to question time. Okay, so, and obviously the OT puts a detective hat on to synthesize all of this information and complete some experiment, experiential learning. All right, I really need to get my skates on. So the first thing we did as a family um, with the client, brothers, mum and dad, OT, we, you guys might have used this um, game. So this is a keeping on track game. And as you can see, it's very well used, a very battered little box. Um, but it, it, I find it really good to use at the start with the client. Um, so I say it's fun, it's a game, but it actually gets them to talk about some of the tools that they already use for sensory regulation and gets them to, and you get to be able to see if they are aware of how their engine speed changes throughout the day. So obviously that's talking about our um, sensory arousal. I started to bring in um, some zones of regulation. I needed to look at a communication tool that could be used for the client across school and home, but also something that he could really grasp and, um, and it made sense to him. So we'll put the link in there for the social thinking and the developer of the zones of regulation. What I do first with my clients, um, and I'm, obviously he's 11 years old, so I'm, I'm cognitively, you know, functioning in a mainstream school. He did have some learning difficulties, um, but you know, he was, he was able to use this. So I use this as a, um, an, another kind of investigation tool, gathering more information. As you can see, homemade, it's not, it's not very price, you know, it's just, yeah, it's basic. And I get the chat, this is based on the incredible five point scale, but obviously there's only four. And we look at all of this, what are the things that happen during the day? Um, it could be getting up for school, it could be losing on your Xbox, it could be someone pushing in the line, it could be um, not having the right materials for school, um, it could be somebody lying, somebody telling fibs in class, and we just get everyday random examples and we get them to rate. Um, number The green is one, regulated, relaxed, green zone, not a problem. The blue is number two, 
then that's kind of, you know, yeah, you're getting me a little bit kind of worried or unhappy about things. Um, the yellow zone is getting a bit grouchy, a bit upset, a bit excitable. Um, and the red zone is why I use, it's, I've flipped my lid, I can't cope anymore, I'm frustrated, I've lost it. So with my young client, um, he actually had 11 triggers in the red zone at that initial time of um, gathering that information. And those, you can see exactly, someone lying, people arguing around me, someone breaking the rules, people rushing, someone touching my things, mum and dad saying no. So pretty normal for an 11 year old, but 11 triggers is taking up a lot of his day in the red zone. So we needed to change that. This is just an example of his yellow zone and blue zone triggers. Okay. And interestingly, um, at the end of our intervention, a lot of, a lot of the red zone triggers have moved into the yellow zone which was good, we could work with that. Okay, so we, myself, I use the top down versus the bottom up approach. So the, the three big things that I wanted to do is get proprioception, get movement and get some tactile input into his day. And the reason I wanted to do that was to engage the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, and I work a lot on the polyvagal um, theory through from Stephen Porges is, um, Basically, yeah, get, get the vagus nerve stimulated because then that actually engages uh, the brainstem and helps with the calming of the sensory system. So these are some of the tools that we originally um, implemented. So we've got going to school on his bike on a morning. We made sure he had water and food breaks very frequently throughout the day. And I'm talking like hourly. Um, the teacher created a chill out playlist which he had on his Chromebook and he was able to put um, his headphones in and just chill out when he was in the, the big classroom learning space and mum had some, made up some some really lovely alerting and calming blends in aromatherapy. Okay so with interoception so interoception, we needed to bring interoception in for this young person. Um, he needed to link what he was happening inside of his body um, to, which was then leading to his, to his emotions and quite often leading him to the sick bay to go home and be saved by his, by his parents. Um, so we wanted to get him in touch with actually what was going on. Um, so that, sorry, that was just a, a quote there from Emma Goodall. Um, so she does the interoception 101 and I've put a reference in there. Um, she, she's a psychologist in South Australia. And that was rolling out really nicely throughout the education sector over there. But it really brings in a lot of OT. So this is um, one of the models that she that she brings together, where she it, interoception focuses on the internal sensory signals of our organs, stomach, bladder, intestines, heart and lungs. Tells us when we're thirsty, hungry, when we need to go to the toilet, we've got a tummy ache or tiredness. It helps to regulate the functions of the body and also in relation to the physical experience of pain. So for my young man, he appeared to have poor interoception awareness of his bodily sensations, such as hunger, thirst, toilet functions. He was not good at his, his awareness of body temperature and often required intervention to help him to remove clothing, to cool down, to have a drink. He would not naturally do this. He had limited awareness of monitoring his energy levels and recognizing the early signs of fatigue to switch tasks. So these factors rolled into a pattern of what we know as boom and bust behaviors, associated for him with a high anxiety response that he was ill again and his brain was not repaired and that he couldn't do what his friends were doing and that this was never gonna go away. So, and also triggered um, a system response. So his family were like, the school can't look after my boy. They're not picking up on these signals. They're not helping him and supporting him. He needs help to maintain the status quo. And every time he goes to school, he goes backwards. So I may as well just keep him home. The teacher aid was not picking up on his support needs at school. 
or the teacher aide would say things like, he looked okay, so I couldn't see any reason why he couldn't finish his maths and why he needed to go to the sick bay. All right, there's a link there for interception. Um, there's a, quite a lot of information from Kelly Ma Ma Mayla, um, Mayor. So yeah, please look at the links at the end. We started getting the teacher aid to do a body check with my client so that he was able to do a body scan. I think we started this off about three times a day when he first came in from school on a morning, after recess and after lunch. So this is just an example of one of the uh, photos that they sent me after his body checking. So he had a tired brain, he had a heavy eyes, he had a runny nose, dry mouth, slow breathing and tense muscles. I also got them to start um, doing a zones tracker. So this is for, for the teacher aid, so that she, um, for the teacher aid and for the client, so that he was able to track what zone he was in. So he chart what zone he was in and also associate that with the body check that he was doing. So this one, he had a slow brain, heavy eyes, a quiet voice and relaxed muscles. So she put on there, he was chilled out which was cool. This is just another example how we brought in um, his experiences um, in the zones and what physically was happening for him in his body. Uh, this, this was not his in particular, this is just an example of uh, ones that are available for us to adapt to our client. I've done ones where we've done them related to Pokemon or um, Fortnite figures. So this is the zones, um, how I used it with my client and how we then associated sensory regulating activities um, for each zone and how we actually use the how's your engine run odometer chart. This is an example of his actual school timetable where you can see how we've actually got in there um, food, movement, fresh air and a body check and sensory tune-up and then the type of things that were happening at home. The biggest thing that just seemed to help really good straight away was actually um, him biking to school on a morning because he was getting that movement and fresh air straight away. I can't talk too much about um, the Mightier Biofeedback Program but I'm happy to catch up with anybody afterwards or um, by email. But this was, um, yeah, as you can see, it's a biofeedback watch linked to a computer game which we introduced with him and this was able to support his learning of diaphragmatic breathing because um, what the watch actually does is it um, rates um, your the amount of times you have a spike in your heart rate and then the amount of time the 18 seconds here of how long it takes you to get from red back down to blue and blue is your resting heart rate so we used the, um, the blow toy with him to really help to stimulate his diaphragmatic breathing um, because uh, when he first started, he was doing it in a really poor posture and not getting that full belly breathing. So this is just a range of the tools that I used in our OT treasure box. Um, a very blended approach, um, looking at sensory regulation, interception, and executive functioning skills. And I'm happy to say that, I haven't got a picture of it, but he went from 11 triggers in the red zone to five at the end of our program. So I was pretty happy with that. And so were his parents and school. Here, uh, links from the key people that I um, follow in relation um, to their work and it really informs my clinical practice, particularly Bruce Perry and uh, Tina Champagne and Stephen Porges um, and obviously Kelly Mayer. Thank you so much and so sorry Tara that I've gone over time so I'm going to stop sharing now and we'll hand you over to Tara. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, I will start my video and see if that works. There you go. Hi. Hello. Thanks, Joe. I was fiddling with 
blue tech trying to regulate myself during your presentation, <laughs> doing some deep breath. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Um, cool, thanks, Joe. Um, slide, Joe. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a family case study that I'm working with here in New Plymouth. Um, so this was, as you can imagine, quite a complex family where you have a solo mum with four children where three out of the four have a diagnosis of autism. They attend four different schools and um, they were also in the process of moving house when I first started. So after about a month of our intervention, they were moving into a new home. So it was chaos for a while. Um, I initially, um, when I was screening the referrals, I was allocated all three of the siblings at once. And then what we decided would be that I would close Lizzie as she was going to be knowing to camp. So we didn't engage then and if needed at the end of our service, we would reopen that case. And I'd work with Kyle and Bella and started off with using stepping stones and so why this comes under self-regulation is because with stepping stones um, we focus on a self-regulatory approach and there's a big focus on supporting parents to be able to manage their self-regulation and engage in their self-care in order to be able to implement some of the strategies and to then get some results. So I'm not going to talk specifically about this program that can answer any questions, but that pyramid is, shows you all the different strategies that the parents can use. And it's a strength-based program and parents um, choose which strategies are and you work with that. And the idea is to do a minimal sufficient in terms of a minimal intervention with, with maximum capacity from the parents. So as you can see from mum's um, depression, anxiety and stress scale. So it looks like it's opposite way, but if I, you can see that the, um, so the smaller green line at the top here, that was post and this is pre. So, and before our intervention, mum was in the moderate range for stress and the same with depression and anxiety and post the stepping stones intervention, she is now under the, um, still in the mild range for stress, but in the normal ranges for depression and anxiety, which is fantastic. And so part of working with um, Bella, Kyle and Lizzie was also focusing on mum self-regulation first in order to be able to get the intervention, prefer to have more space to then be able to respond and help their children with their emotional regulation. So what's really cool is mum on her own initiative started attending Tahi, which is um, just a local community, um, movement and mindfulness center here. And so her and Lizzie, her teenage daughter, started attending together on a Monday morning and mum would do things for herself as well during the week, like going to get coffee or five minutes of self care when she could, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the big um, things I noticed when I've been moved back to New Plymouth last year was the lack of respite options or ability for parents to use care respite. So, I work with children with intellectual disabilities and autism. And what I found is that they'd have these care respite hours and they couldn't use them because they're responsible to find a support worker or whoever to employ and it's only $76 a day for the eight hours. And so with my friends at Craft Haven, which is a group that my mum actually attends, um, which is a normal community craft, um, community place that they open during the week and on weekends, we set up a girl a girls craft group, which the 12 to 16 year olds who were high functioning with a maximum of six participants. And so um, not everyone will have a diagnosis that attends, some may have high anxiety, um, and it's just been kind of word of mouth and just using our accessibility, like our NASC, as well as just me emailing ASD coordinator, et cetera, at and the Child Development Centre. And so we're into our third term, which is amazing. And we now have six participants and we've decided to cap it at that. And so I kind of can, would go up and they set the, the, the content, but I kind of would give advice in terms of do a little pre-screening phone call with parents and find out what some of their triggers may be 
and what some strategies they need in terms of like there's one girl who doesn't like to be touched um, and, and looking at the, the, we can control the noise and we can look at how we can add in different um, elements from a sensory perspective. Um, so what's been amazing is that for both of my, this case study, both of the siblings, so both Bella and Lizzie will attend, um, their names have been changed by the way, so um, it's all good to be talking about that. And so they, what's cool is mum's reported that Lizzie, who's the eldest one, who um, likes, she comments about how she likes the way the different paper and the mediums feel, and she's very talented, so she's very gifted and has um, a lot of strengths in artwork, and I've noticed over the course of the time her confidence in terms of increasing, in terms of asking for things, um, and also the same with my client, Bella. One of the problems was is often she'd be turning up and she'd be already dysregulated, and so what we needed to do was come up with some strategies to assist with that. And so talking with mum, she decided that she would let them catch the bus because one day when her car was broken down, they both caught the bus independently and she worked well. So she's been catching the bus now for the past three weeks or four weeks and she's turning up, um, she's regulated, she's calm and she sits at a different spot to her sister and so she's not annoying her sister and she's um, engaging and completing the work and, and less distracted, which is amazing. Um, and this is Bella's sensory profile. Um, what was interesting about this is that historically, mum uh, would talk to me about how she was a seeker as a child and like would be, you know, and I see that at craft group, she will adds, she wants to use, use her fingers to, um, as the tools instead of a paintbrush and she wraps ribbons around like, you know, any, any texture, the fabric that she'll choose, but she adds more. Um, and what's interesting, which is another element to this case as well, is technology. And so, and it's part of the behavioral um, that we're working on as well in terms of her wanting access to technology all the time. Um, and so even though her adolescent profile suggests that she's less than others in sensation seeking, I don't agree with that, but I do, in terms of the low registration, that's definite in terms of getting really, really overwhelmed um, and suddenly it's a really big deal compared to not noticing those cues. Um, and part of the interventions that we did in Stepping Stones have helped create her to become independent at routines by just using visual schedules, um, as well as mum taking notice of the environment and understanding the sensory preferences as well, in terms of there were boxes and unpacking that was occurring for about three months once they'd moved in. So as you can imagine for a child with autism, um, that is also um, has a pattern of low registration that would have been really, really stressful. And I just want to add as well um, that the Stepping Stones intervention finished before we then focused on the sensory um, intervention as, um, and that's how I'm still involved, is just focusing on the sensory stuff now and tying it all together. Um, so what we did is linking in with um, looking at when technology was removed in terms of um, just more boundary to having rules, mum would notice that then Bella would have more access to seeking out other kind of occupations to do, like playing with the doll's house again or being more creative. And one of our sessions that we did was, they, she already had a weighted blanket, but it had been in storage. Um, and she already had some compression wear, but again, it, was in, it, it had been in storage and not accessible. So one of the sessions we did, and this is which was really cool, is we invited her older sister, Lizzie, who wasn't, um, her referral wasn't open, but who I'd known through craft group. Um, came and we did an experiential session just in the home with what they had. Mum made an effort to get everything out of storage so then we could sit there and we um, trialled different equipment, looked at the different responses and using more kind of Tina Champagne for sensory modulation and looking at what's calming and alerting and we kind of had some visuals and we did a little marking for each of the girls and with mum and I. Um, and for Bella, 
She now has a little calming corner in her room where she'll have a bean bag and lots of um, cushions with her weighted blanket. And she also has other polar fleeces and other different kind of textured blankets that she has. She has a fidget box um, of things from her own room that's all in one place, so it's easily accessible. As with four siblings, often things can go missing quite easily. And she has, um, I had a mandala colouring in book that I just photocopied a lot from and she now has like a little box of mandalas that she will colour in and mum is reporting that she will go in there after school um, so after the um, after dinner for about an hour she'll listen to her music even maybe 30 to 40 minutes she's significantly calmer and she's now and she still is doing her bedtime routine independently which she had been and without yelling and screeching at siblings which um, that had reduced as well from the stepping stones input too in terms of introducing visuals, but just in terms of her overall um, coming and falling asleep a lot faster, which is awesome. What was um, interesting, so I'll go back to that other slide. So what was interesting with Lizzie from that session was that she really um, took to peppermint and as well as vibration. And so what's amazing is that um, she, we just started talking about difficult times of day and because she was already known to CAMS and so I'm, I'm not her therapist, I wasn't sure exactly what some of those are, but we, she just talked about things like transitions between classes at high school and um, mathematics where it was really hard to concentrate and so she was worried about getting told off for having mints and so we talked about what time of days could she use that at school without getting in trouble, you know, because she was scared about getting in trouble for the teacher. And she has, um, and her mum has told me that she has been independently filling up her own container of the mints at home and she uses them and she's noticed a big difference. And so then I've emailed that feedback in an email to her camp therapist um, for them to continue to use in their strategies. Um, in regards to vibration, that I'm not sure how often she may be using that, but she has access to that at home if she wants to do. Um, before bed and um, because one of the big things with this family was they needed to be more independent self-regulation strategies because mum has limited capacity to be able to have x amount of time for each child um, with everything else and she's also just gone back to studying um, for nursing full-time in the last this just started last month and um, one thing that's been been great with that is that's been, been a big motivation for her to try and get you know all of the interventions in place to um, things like within the environment, stabilizing and having more time. And she did and follow the Stepping Stones program really well. But another thing as well is going back to occupation, back to um, is looking at household chores and thinking about what um, jobs, because she's and what mum's found is that she found giving each child choice, you could do this or that, and then that increase the likelihood of them doing it rather than trying to create this big flash roster and it just not not working and that was kind of mum was finding that overwhelming so what we we did after I shared the kind of the sensory profile with in particular to Bella was talk about okay what are all your household chores that you have we wrote them all out and then we highlighted what was you know your proprioception your heavy work and looking at the, and the elements in terms of what what task components are there the touch you know etc and then she could identify which ones and then as she was doing that which was quite amazing as she realized that all those jobs that would be beneficial for the Bella were jobs that she would often do before the kids got home or not and so the kids were quite would be quite sedentary after school and the risk with Bella as well is that if she's given a screen like she could be on that screen for us up to three hours and, it, and it, you can get quite a big emotional um, reaction with being asked to transition off it and so it's really important to have those clear rules about when there's going to be screen time and then also building in other things like she's now mum's now letting her catch the bus home after school where she was getting picked up and now she gives Bella that choice and she said that what's been amazing is in the last couple of weeks she's noticed that she's choosing to bus home a lot more so we talked about um, looking at, at, at how important that will be for her going forward but also adding in more movement and so as a family she's got a new goal where she's going to try and do like you know just nature walks three times a week 
with all of them because we have that benefit as well as trying to like stop doing a lot of the things herself and letting the children help out a little bit more with some of those physical jobs. Um, and it's also just, you know, teaching life skills and it works for this family because it is, um, it is busy so she can't, like mum says, it needs to be able to fit in with, uh, with our daily routine and what we, what we can do because there's only one of me, which is very true. Um, and so in regards to, sorry, is that, oh, there we go. Um, in regards to other resources that I find really helpful, this is um, Mindful Nets. I don't know if it will play, but we can have a look. It's a really nice visual for teaching um, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so if it, oh, I don't think the computer's going to play, sorry. Um, but what it is, is this app you can download, or I there's ones on YouTube too. It is as you can see in that, and you can set the timer for the inhale and the exhale. So it will guide you at breathing in. So you can start as small as two, one or two seconds, hold for two seconds, and then breathe out. And when I've worked with other um, teenagers with, um, with autism, especially they find the visual really, really helpful to get that concept of diaphragmatic breathing compared to maybe something that may be a little bit more of an abstract um, component. And then over time, you just increase the seconds and then they can then start independently using that deep breathing. Um, before this presentation, I was quite nervous at the whole topic being kind of on interception. I was thinking I can talk about sensory modulation, but I don't know if I specifically would be a good person to be really, really um, have clues on interception. So I, when I was doing some reading, it was thinking about, okay, how can I add this more into my practice and get more skilled up? And so I think some of the resources that Joe shared and as well um, on the SIG groups in terms of the Kelly and I found this that was, was hers on the website and I thought that was great and it's thinking we already do ask a lot of this but I think for me um, I can probably ask a little bit more and use that kind of OT skills and being able to think about different activities and the components of them to see if they actually notice those sensations and um, like when you know whether it's hot or cold and, and, and different body parts in terms of what parts of their body can they scan in and check um, and what do they need more support with going forward. And so, it, yeah, it seems like a really exciting time. And I think the, again, with jo, um, the same with Joe with proprioception, vestibular, building it into your daily routine, thinking of things are practical um, and using yeah, for me, it's, it's it's making it, the parents have to be able to do it and it has to be achievable and it, and starting with one thing and just continuing to add. Um, but happy for any questions or anything like that. And if people wanted more specifics around um, the stepping stones, et cetera, that, that's fine too. Um, and for my client, especially for Bella, we're still working. Um, the next steps will be me as well, like similar to Joe, using the incredible five-point scale at getting that and recognizing and then sharing the report with school um, because it's school don't notice anything. She's really good at masking. And so it's more looking at can there be some things in the afternoon um, or even movement breaks within the day, like they're delivering messages to the office, um, wiping down the whiteboard, those types of things, or putting the, putting the chairs up on the desk for the cleaner, you know, like any jobs like that that she could do that would be able to help. Um, and thinking about throughout the day as well. Um, yeah, that's me. Sorry, did I try and race through? Is that, I can't, don't have a time on me, so is that our way for time? I'll stop sharing here. Oh, Joe, your microphone's off. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Tara. So we've got a couple of chat questions. I'm just going to open them up and see what they are. Let's see here. Uh, no. Are there any questions? If anybody has any questions, all you need to do now is just simply turn on your microphone and your camera. You should you should come through. Oh, we're all very shy. 
and I can put my slides back up if there was some, for example, like the client information and things like that that weren't, that people didn't get enough time to read. I do apologize, but I was just conscious of the time. Okay. No. Hi, Joe. Okay. Um, oh. Are you able to hear me? Yes, right. can. Hi. Hi, Joe. Um, nice to hear you. It was um, very informative. Um, lots of um, things to take home. Um, I was wondering, um, do you have any, any method for assessing interception? Like we use sensory profile for all the other sensory systems, but we don't really have anything to assess um, interception. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah, so I'm happy to come and, and share my uh, interception um, assessment kit with you. I must say, I don't use it in its entirety because it's a pretty in depth assessment. And I generally always start with the sensory profile assessment, mm -hmm. which, which does touch on, you know, your temperature regulation, your pain perception like, and things like that. Um, but I do find using it with the primary school age kids who, um, uh, you know, got the, got that cognitive ability um, to, it's bit, yeah, so I, uh, there is an interception um, awareness assessment kit. Um, and I generally just use the very, um, it, you, I use it very briefly. I don't use it in its entirety, but I'm happy to come and have um, a coffee catch up with you guys at the hut. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you now. Minakshi, sorry, Minakshi, could you turn your mic on, please? Oh, I was talking without the mic on, sorry. <laughs> um, it would be awesome to have that um, resource um, because we do a lot of interception related work in our alert program with our um, kids. Yeah. Um, some of the children are very good in understanding how they are feeling from inside, but most of them, um, for them, parents um, help them with that um, thing. So one assessment um, would be really good to have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll find it. We'll book a time with you. Definitely, I love that. Thank you. Okay, so obviously we've got the special interest group form that you, you guys can carry on the conversation. Um, so I would encourage you um, to do so. And thank you very much for those that have sent in messages saying how they've enjoyed this presentation. Um, and I guess if the interest uh, continues to be out there, there's no reason why we can't do this again on a regular basis. So uh, with that said, um, and the time being close now to two o'clock, mm -hmm. Lily? <laughs> we'll get Lily to close us out with a carrot here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And thanks for coming to the meeting. Thanks, Joe and Tara. Um, we'll just close up and leave you guys to the day. Kia ora, 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 kia